Hello, I'm Melinda Nusifora and welcome to this special edition of Straight Talk, where we'll review the biggest events that impacted Turkey this year. No story has arguably hit the Turkish leadership more and put Turkey in the spotlight than the murder of Saudi journalist and government critic Jamal Khashoggi. It all started on the 2nd of October when Khashoggi enters the Saudi consulate in Istanbul and never comes out. The next day, Saudi authorities confirm Khashoggi's disappearance but insist that he left the consulate alive and well. In a statement, officials say he requested paperwork and exited shortly after. Nine days after Khashoggi's disappearance, Turkish investigators are still denied access to the consulate. However, a specialised Saudi cleanup crew, including a toxicologist, arrive in Istanbul and begin daily work at the site. Finally, on October 15th, Turkish investigators search the consulate for more than eight hours, removing a range of samples from the building. More than two weeks after his disappearance, Saudi Arabia finally acknowledges that Khashoggi was killed, but say it was a fist fight inside the consulate. 18 people allegedly connected to the killing are arrested and two officials, uh, close to Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, are fired. After weeks of coordinated leaks, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan announces that Khashoggi's killing was premeditated and planned at the highest levels of the Saudi government. That forces Saudi Arabia's hand, and two days later, the public prosecutor changes his stance and describes the murder as premeditated rather than an accident. In November, Saudi prosecutors announce the kingdom will seek the death penalty for five out of the 11 people charged in the murder. He simultaneously exonerates the crown prince of any involvement. At the end of November, US President Donald Trump is still backing MBS, claiming that there is nothing definitive linking the Crown Prince to Khashoggi's murder. Now, that puts him at odds with the US Senate, which in December passes a non-binding resolution that says Mohammed bin Salman is responsible for the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Almost three months on and there's still plenty to dissect. Joining me in the studio is Matthew Breiser, a former US ambassador to Azerbaijan and Talib Kuchukjan, who is a senior fellow at the TRT World Research Center and was also a member of the Turkish parliament until June this year. Gentlemen, thank you for breaking down 2018 with us. Matthew, I'm going to start with you. The death of Jamal Khashoggi was arguably the biggest news story in the world for the two months after his death. But since then, it started to drop out of the headlines a little bit and there hasn't been any real tangible uh, kind of repercussions for Saudi Arabia. After all the talk, after all the international condemnation, is it just business as usual now for the Crown Prince? Well, uh, it's not just business as usual because there's just been a, a reshuffling of the Saudi government. Uh, it would appear that some of the people who were closest to the crown prince in the most sensitive positions have lost those positions or been demoted. And uh, the former finance minister who had been imprisoned under the crown prince's authority during that so-called crackdown uh, is back uh, and in a very senior position as foreign minister. Uh, so there have been some repercussions, but the big one that people wondered about, would the crown prince lose his, his status mm, as the crown prince? I mean, prince? those That's seem to happening. just be on the, surf, on, on the sidelines, doesn't it? The big one is the crown prince yeah. himself. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I, it was never likely that he would lose that authority as the crown prince. He's been chastised. He's been reined in. Uh, but as you said, uh, unfortunately, uh, the game that the crown prince was playing, together with Donald Trump, to let the clock run out, uh, seems to be ensuing. And I just hope that people do keep the story alive. I'd like to add that I think the Turkish government handled this in a way that surprised many people with its skill. Uh, by keeping the story alive as long as it did through the step-by-step uh, -step leaking of information that never would have been known otherwise. Mm, it's interesting you say that because that leads me on to the question I've got for you, Talib. This incident escalated so quickly from an international murder plot 
up to a diplomatic disaster for both Turkey, Saudi Arabia and the United States. It put all three of them at loggerheads. Turkey, as you say, Matthew, played its hand really quite well. It was in a compromising position. During this whole political diplomatic stoush, how do you think Turkey has fared throughout? I think right from the beginning of this incident, unfortunate incident, uh, Turkish government was prepared to bring things into the light. Therefore, whatever Turkey had at the time, uh, the government started to share it with the international community, including its allies, and also including the Saudi Arabia to encourage the Saudis to be more open uh, on this issue. Otherwise, I think the, uh, everybody would have uh, forgotten the issue. Uh, it was Turkey and the Turkish government uh, uh, consistently wanted to shed light on the, on the, uh, on the crimes. And also, uh, in the beginning, you would remember that the Saudi authorities denied any, uh, mm. any involvement in it. But later on, when Turkey started to share the evidence and also the talks, uh, this uh, shocking talks uh, and the conversations, uh, and al also the information, uh, the 17 guys who came to Turkey and then they took part in the killing, I think it is a, uh, it's a, a sad story, uh, but I think Turkey brought it to the light. Uh, unfortunately, has you know, in, in, in the beginning... Has diplomatic stance shifted a little bit? Um, has it sort of maybe gained a little bit more control, maybe a little bit more power I think, you know, this? if you want to press Saudi government, uh, Saudi authorities, Turkey cannot do everything on its own, and Turkey therefore wanted to share all the information with the US, with the European Union, and with all other, I think, governmental agencies, etc. And it was the duty of the international community. It is, Tur Turkey cannot solve the whole issue on its own. The internal, I think, dynamics are here, and the investigation is going on, and we do our full cooperation with the Saudi government, uh, Saudi authorities as well. But what we see here is that I think, uh, in my view, Turkey has done its own, uh, uh, I think, share. Uh, but the international community, unfortunately, as Birze just hinted, I think there was that double standard. When we talk about the, you know, openness, when we talk about transparency and accountability, I think the international community terribly failed in uh, questioning the Saudi government and Saudi authorities. Yes, now there is a shuffle. Uh, some people lost their jobs. Uh, but the guy who is uh, supposed to be the main, I think, uh, culprit in that incident, he keeps his job. I think he will remain there because uh, the, the incident uh, is going, is, it is not going to die away. But I think, as you have said, it is not going to be top priority in 2019. Mm. Well, we'll leave that discussion there for a moment and move on to another one of the big stories this year when we talk about Turkey-US relations. In 2018, it has been a roller coaster year for relations between Turkey and the United States. Numerous events, including the murder of Turk, uh, journalist Jamal Khashoggi, the imprisonment of Pastor Andrew Brunson, and also the war in Syria, has really taken its toll on relationships between the two countries. Sometimes friends, but quite often foes, the controversies have had a severe impact on Turkey's economy. Omer Kablan explains. In the days following the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, the unease in the relationship between Turkey and the United States was visible once again. At one point, Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlüt Çavuşoğlu even accused US President Donald Trump of turning a blind eye to Khashoggi's killing. Yani Trump'ın bu yaptığı açıklama ne olursa olsun ben işte e, gözümü yumarım anlamına da geliyor. Bu doğru bir yaklaşım değildir. Her şey para değildir. But that was not the worst the two countries saw in 2018. The case of US pastor Andrew Brunson, who was arrested in 2016 on terror charges, pushed ties between the NATO allies to new lows. And while the Turkish government waited for a court of law to decide Brunson's future, Trump lost patience and doubled metal tariffs on Turkey and also imposed sanctions on two Turkish government officials. Turkey responded with sanctions of its own. But the crisis triggered a sharp fall in the lira, which lost more than a quarter of its value in August alone. Brunson was freed by a Turkish court in October, which resulted in a relative normalization of ties and also helped bring stability to the Turkish lira. President Trump welcomed his release, saying it will lead to good, perhaps great relations between the United States and Turkey. But while Brunson is back in the US, significant grievances remain on both sides. Turkey is still waiting for a positive response on its extradition request for cleric and businessman Fethullah Gulen, who lives in Pennsylvania. He's the man Turkey believes is behind a failed coup in 2016 that killed 250 people. 
Turkey has also not stepped back from its plans to buy the Russian missile defense system, the S-400, despite serious US concerns. This has fueled demands in the US that planned deliveries of F-35 jets can be put on hold even though portions of fighter jets are being built in Turkey. The US reliance on the YPG to fight Daesh in Syria has not helped bilateral ties either. The YPG is the Syrian offshoot of the PKK, the terror group that Turkey has been fighting for decades. The list of disagreements between Turkey and the United States is a long one, but it is imperative for both to find common grounds, especially on issues like Syria. Oman Kablan, Straight Talk. With so many issues still unresolved, let's talk about what the new year will bring for US-Turkey relations. Matthew, we're going to start with you again. Donald Trump, he has accepted an invitation from Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan to visit in 2019. What do you think will be on the top of their discussion agenda? Hmm. Well, I would guess probably the, the moving out of US forces from Syria and Turkey moving in uh, will be at the very top. And I think uh, this is actually a great moment potentially for turning around U.S.-Turkey relations. Now the decision by President Trump was, is extremely unpopular in Washington, uh, but as far as U.S.-Turkey relations go, uh, if the U.S. and Turkey can work together on the transition, if Turkey does take on the responsibility to, to stabilize northern Syria, which means of course expelling the YPG, and if the U.S. facilitates Turkey's efforts and doesn't oppose them, I think we could see a, a new er, a positive era in U.S.-Turkey relations. But besides that, there are other difficult issues on the agenda, including mm. the, uh, Fethullah Gulen. Fethullah Gulen, sure. that's yeah. the one. That's one. Do you think it's going to be raised? Oh, for sure it will mm. be raised. You know, in recent weeks, it's leaked out of Washington that President Trump was checking to see whether or not or how to have uh, Mr. Gulen extradited. Uh, we know that the FBI has been proceeding with an investigation, an organized criminal investigation of the Gulen network in the United States. So clearly the, the, the wheels of justice are turning in the United States uh, to Gulen's disadvantage. Uh, the question remains, though, is there enough information available to convince a, a judge in a U.S. court of law uh, to proceed with the extradition? But I, I'm convinced that President Trump would like to see the extradition happen. Mm, it's going to be a really interesting one, that. Uh, but I'm going to come back to uh, the U.S. pulling out of Syria, Talib. They're currently pulling out now. Uh, they had been working alongside Turkey's sworn enemy, the YPG. Do you think the U.S. pullout is going to have a positive effect on Turkey-U.S. relations? Because that has been a sticking point for so long. Well, I think there is an optimistic uh, view on Turkey, an expectation as well, uh, as far as we can see. I think that decision is in itself, you know, uh, regardless of the uh, developments later on, is uh, welcoming. Uh, Turkey's the government has welcomed this decision. But let me underline one fact. Turkey was not objecting the presence of U.S. soldiers uh, in, mm. in Syria. What Turkey objected was U.S. support to YPG. Uh, this was the main issue between Turkey and the U.S. actually. Therefore, Turkey expects that the, you know, by withdrawal also U.S. will withdraw its support from PYD and YPG. Because they haven't as Trump, said that though yet, right, have they? Yes, I think that, that is going to be one of the discussions between Trump and mm -hmm. Erdogan if Trump comes next year to Turkey. Because our uh, main purpose, Turkey would like to clean this area from uh, any terrorist groups. Uh, as Turkey perceives them uh, a threat to national security and also uh, uh, regional stability. This will continue. But again, the decision uh, has been welcomed by the Turkish government and Turkish authorities, although there is a uh, you know, criticism within the U.S. government uh, about this. But I think what we seek for is a regional stability, you know, political transition. I think Trump uh, a few days ago also stated that there should be political transition in Syria as well, because as uh, the, you know, the, the world community believes that the Assad regime lost its uh, 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 transparency, accountability, and also legitimacy, because now uh, half of the population is displayed. Uh, five and a half million are living around uh, the country in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon. And within the country, we see enmities, we see a lot of troubles. Uh, so th therefore, I think this is an important move. But what matters is if the following developments, because also U.S. expects from Turkey that you know there are some remnants of Daesh, and Turkey mm, uh, is going to, to take some responsibility. Uh, this is not, a, of course, easy job, but I think Turkey has some experience in terms of intervention in the northern part of Syria, militarily with some uh, local forces. And I think we have seen in two cases that there has been relative success. And also, as the Turkish uh, Minister of Interior explained, almost 300,000 Syrians uh, now are back to their own countries because of those uh, interventions. Mm. 
To break down Turkey's operations in Syria this year, I'm joined by TRT World Correspondent Sarah Firth in the northeastern Syrian city of Jarablus. Sarah, first of all, let's talk about Operation Olive Branch. Turkey at the moment is poised to launch its third operation within Syria, but it does so on the back of its successful second operation. Explain to us again what the goal of Operation Olive Branch was in the first half of this year. Well, Operation Olive Branch started uh, late January. It went on for some 58 days. And the main point of that operation was uh, Turkey and the Free Syrian Army, backed by Turkey, uh, clearing the area of Afrin of the YPG, which Turkey considers the offshoot of the PKK uh, terror group. Now, uh, we were up on the front lines with uh, the uh, Free Syrian Army uh, soldiers and the Turkish soldiers as part of that operation. Uh, and it was a pretty tough operation getting past uh, up on Mount Basaya, getting past uh, the uh, opposition that they had from the YPG. So some very fierce fighting took place during that operation. But overall, it was successful. And Melinda, you're right. Uh, there have been two such operations. Jarablus, where we are right now in northern Syria. This was cleared in 2016 from uh, Daesh uh, holes uh, under Operation Euphrates Shield. So both Operation Euphrates Shield and Operation Olive Branch that took place earlier this year, they went ahead successfully, but Turkey is poised for its most important operation to date, and that again will be focusing on breaking YPG holes on territory in northern Syria. The Syrian regime, though, in the southern parts of the country has really uh, been quite successful this year in uh, reclaiming a lot of its territory back from opposition and rebel forces. And one of the battles which really made international headlines was the battle for eastern Ghouta. Remind us again why that assault just captured such international attention. I think we've seen many, many severe regime assaults and brutality on areas in Syria from Homs to Aleppo. Uh, what happened in Eastern Ghouta in April this year, though, uh, really did, as you say, shock the world. I was in Idlib in the north of Syria uh, on the 1st of January 2018 and already there were people there who had fled that area that had been under rebel control since 2011, since the very start of the uprising. It was the major rebel stronghold near Damascus and they held on very fiercely to that territory until April of this year when the regime went in extremely hard. Now for months in the lead up to that, what we saw was the area be besieged by the regime. No food was getting uh, into the area. People were starving in that area and the regime was launching attacks constantly. Uh, as a result of that, uh, there was a 30-day ceasefire called by the UN Security Council. Even Russia agreed to that, uh, but there were violations all through. In the end, what happened was the rebels in that group ended up having to be evacuated out and the regime took control. And you said it was supposed to be a de-escalation zone. Only one de-escalation zone now remains, and that's Idlib, where a lot of these rebel fighters were evacuated to. There was a point in time this year when the United Nations was calling this a humanitarian catastrophe waiting to happen. And we all sort of seemed to be poised with bated breath, uh, waiting for uh, something to happen in Idlib, but it didn't. What is the situation like there now? The people in Idlib, the civilians on the ground, and it's estimated there are some three million civilians, and many of them uh, are people who have uh, lost their homes in other parts of Syria that the regime have attacked, and they fled as far as they can go, which is Idlib, as you said, the last de-escalation zone. They're scared about what is going to happen. For now, there is a buffer zone uh, that is holding, but for now, and what we've seen in the past is that these uh, deals get put into place, the regime tries its luck and eventually goes in and that's what people there are so scared of. What I think is really important though at the end of this year to look at though is two things. One, we are still on the brink of a humanitarian catastrophe in Idlib. The people there are extremely vulnerable. The forces there are vulnerable as well. You've got uh, groups like HTS that are considered by the international community uh, as a, a terrorist organization essentially in control of large parts of Idlib. What is important though is talking over the last month to the Free Syrian Army groups in particular in areas like Jarablus, uh, other areas in northern Syria and with Turkey's upcoming operation is that there is still a credible threat 
to the regime, from Turkey, from the Free Syrian Army. We've seen a new coalition form, if you like, with Russia and Turkey and Iran managing to get around the table this year with the Sochi talks. And that has been somewhat successful in actually getting the groups on the ground to agree to these deals that are being made. For now, though, the civilians in Idlib remain in an extremely precarious situation. And it's why this upcoming operation that Turkey's going to carry out in northern Syria is so important. It will bolster the Free Syrian Army. It will break the YPG hold on some of the territory and it will weaken the regime. And that is what everyone in Idlib wants to see happen. They want a higher level of security than they currently have. And I think the whole world has been watching this for nearly eight years now play out in Syria. 2018 has been particularly brutal on the ground in Syria. And everyone is asking that we speak to the Syrians that we meet every time we come in. When is the world going to intervene and stop the regime from carrying out these attacks? Well, it looks like there is going to be a very busy 2019 ahead as well. Sarah, thank you so much for that background report. So what would the US withdrawal from Syria mean for the region? Let's come back to our guests here in the studio. Talib, Turkey's third operation in Syria, when it does eventually begin, will be east of the Euphrates River. With the US gone and the YPG then focused on fighting Turkey in the northeast, does that leave a risk now for Daesh to regroup in the south? I think we believe that the Daesh has lost its credibility in the region and also lost their soldiers and military power, etc. Uh, of course, they might try, uh, but at this point, what we should do is to combat uh, ideology of Daesh, actually. Because if you look at the corners and the spots that they are controlling uh, for Turkey, it won't be very difficult to confine or to, to eliminate the remaining forces. Uh, therefore, Turkey is prepared. And also in the past, actually, the Turkish government uh, was ready and it was shared by the U.S. government that Turkey can work with the, uh, with the U.S. government to fight uh, with Daesh. But at the time, the U.S. government, unfortunately, from the Turkish point of view, has chosen to work with the PYD and YPG. Uh, we see them as uh, the uh, offshoot of PKK in Turkey. Therefore, for, for Turkey uh, uh, and for the regional, I think, uh, countries, uh, it's uh, quite important to deal with the non-state actors in the region. Otherwise, if we leave the non-state actors to take the opportunity and capitalize on the instability in the region, we are going to confront a lot of uh, troubles. Therefore, Turkey uh, is ready, is prepared. Mm. And as I said, and we have uh, had two operations uh, in, in the past, and both operations were uh, quite successful. And also it was welcomed by the people who were li living on the ground. I think this is very important. As far as the eastern part of Euphrates is concerned and some of the areas that we talk about, we talk about uh, uh, places where uh, populated by, uh, the, by the Arabs, by the Turkomans, by Kurds as well. I think their expectations also to see some kind of stability so that they can normalize their own lives. Mm. Therefore, we do not see PYD and YPG as the representative of Kurds because in the Western media what we see is that sometimes PYD and YPG are, are presented as if they are the sole representatives of the, of the Kurd, Kurds. Uh, and mm. again, I would like to underline the fact that for the future of the Kurdish people, I think, in this region, it's uh, good to have a stable, uh, I think, positions. Matthew, after eight years of war now, Assad is still mm -hmm. in power. He's still firmly in power and the regime has even won back many of its lost territories. So what does 2019 look like for Syria and this battle in general? Yeah, I think it's pretty clear that Assad, unfortunately, has, has won the war. Mm. He's going to remain in power, it looks like, barring some completely unforeseen circumstance, uh, like an assassination attempt. Uh, he, there are already reports today that, that Syrian regime forces are moving into the Manbij area, areas that will be vacated by U.S. troops. It's not clear if, if that's accurate because the U.S. troops are still there, but I think we will see yeah, the Assad regime consolidate control. Uh, we'll see Russia still playing an important role, but I doubt it will expand its military uh, footprint. I think it'll try to reduce it. I think President Putin does not want to be caught in a, in a military quagmire in Syria. Uh, we'll see Iran trying to expand its influence. So much is going to depend on Turkey mm. and the extent to which uh, Turkey is successful uh, in making sure the remnants of Daesh don't come back. Uh, but really, most importantly, in uh, eliminating the YPG presence in northern Syria and returning stability so that, as you were just saying, Talib, uh, that more than those 300,000 uh, refugees will be able to return. And if and when that happens, 
Um, I think we will see the attitudes in, in the West, in the United States and in Europe shifting to an understanding that indeed, as you said, the YPG does not represent the Kurds. The YPG is a far left Marxist Leninist terrorist organization uh, and it has not treated the Kurdish population particularly well nor the Arab population. So Turkey has a chance really to shape uh, much of the destiny of Syria here if it has the stomach mm. uh, to, to, to stick it out and conduct those military operations in the north. We'll have to leave it there gentlemen but that's really interesting insights. I thank both of you for your time as we review 2018 on Straight Talk. Thank you for joining us for this Year in Review edition of Straight Talk. Be sure to share any comments you have with us on Twitter using the hashtag Straight Talk. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll see you again in the new year.